All right, back with Alex and another episode of Story World. How's it going, my friend? I'm doing well. How about you, sir? Sweet man, I'm doing I'm doing good. Excited to talk about this topic. I'm loving every episode. Um, it's it's been so fun. I was looking back at our episodes today, my episode list, and um, just like I feel like we've really talked about some helpful stuff here. I mean, all three people that listen to it are really getting a. <laughs> They're uh, really good. The two two of them being us. Right, right, right. I wonder who that third sorry sucker is. I know. Um, I really have him wrapped in there. I do have a friend who decided to uh, like binge the first five episodes all in one day. Man. So, oh, that's, who knows? That's pretty know. surprised that's put him to sleep. But that's uh, brave. That's super yeah. brave. Absolutely. So, uh, cool. Well, so this week, what we're going to do is going to be kind of more fun, a little bit less formal. We're going to talk about the different mediums of storytelling or because there's lots of different ways that you can tell a story uh, music movies of, of different kinds and uh, podcasts you know you name it so we figured we would just kind of talk through each of those things and see where we ended up yeah absolutely this will it's kind of switching up i know that last week we kind of i think it was a two hour long podcast and we dug into <laughs> some, it was fun obviously yeah. but we dug into some more serious measures i know our next one is a little bit more serious too so figured we'd kind of enter this with a little bit more casualness and a little bit less thought going into it just yeah see what happens 100 percent, 100 percent. so um so let's dive right in medium number one books and uh and writing right the written word the, yeah the written word and so i think this one just is kind of natural i guess i mean i would say the most popular form of storytelling aside from i guess verbal storytelling passed down you know um from yeah. thousands of years ago but um I think this is kind of what people learn for us as far as far as storytelling. Yeah, you hear stories told by your parents and from, you know, you know, church or friends telling stories, but really it's when you're younger and you learn how to read and you get like your first school book. And then especially if you do get into reading, then yeah. you read bigger and bigger books. And it seems like every point, if you're into stories and somewhat reading, you kind of go through that phase as a kid where you enjoy picking up a new book and, and reading it because it's exciting. Um, yeah, it, I think too, it's, uh, it's funny cause it doesn't really deal, um, with any other exterior sensory items. Like you're not listening to music. Um, no one's talking to you, but your mind just ends up filling everything else as you're reading the book. I don't know. I think it's a excellent form of storytelling just from the fact of you can kind of use your imagination to fill in the gaps where it doesn't address things, you know, necessarily specifically. Yeah, for sure. Um, I think that, and so it's interesting, like, like books, like books weren't always a, a thing, right? Like we had, we had tablets for a while. Um, that was sort of the first, you know, stone tablets were sort of where, where it all kind of began. Um, and then scrolls, you know, parchment paper and things like that as, as, as time went on. And eventually, um, things began to, it was actually religious folks who actually just created the first uh, books. So, so you can thank Jesus for books. Uh, but, but honest, a lot of honest, them. yeah, yes, yes. And honest to goodness that they were, they were some of the first to like actually take these, these scrolls, these independent pieces of writing and, and, and I guess collate them all together into what we would know as, as a book today. And of course the, the printing press, and then, you know, you know, the rest of, of civilization takes off. Um, and from that time on it's books are the primary way that people um, learn things. And now, of course, it, it's so funny because immediately when we say the word books, it's, it's almost natural at this point, <laughs> you immediately started going into how they affect you because of the story, yeah. like the fictional stories and stuff. And I immediately did, I didn't think about that at all. I immediately thought about all the great things that I've learned from yeah. books and all the, um, all the wonderful, true pieces of, of information and things that I have, I have been, you know, able to, to learn and to understand as a result of reading. I was yeah. going to say that, um, that Funny. books for sure started out, um, I mean, really to kind of, and I'm not a historian and all this stuff on this subject matter, but it was a way to communicate with yeah. people to, I mean, whether you're looking at the Holy Bible and trying to distribute it to the masses. So the church wasn't kept it or just even other forms of instruction and knowledge and, you know, spreading what, so to help people understand certain things. And then of course, as it was made more readily available, then you had more common uh, fictional stuff being written and more entertainment and satire and things like that. So it's just a very cool evolution until I think my, I don't, I'm sorry if I stole your story of the week. I thought we were planning on talking about it at some point, but even now where people think, oh, reading is kind of dying, but look at what Brandon Sanderson did on Kickstarter. 
you know, yeah, man. $40 million. So cool. It's just, it's just really inspiring to see how, and obviously his is very straight fiction and how people yeah. just love reading still. I mean, obviously yeah. his is a unusual case because he's just at the very top of his tier, but it's, uh, it's just an incredible form of storytelling, even amidst yeah. all of the YouTube videos and social media and how you can just open up your phone and get sucked into stuff. People still love opening up their book or turning on their Kindle and just, and just reading. Yeah, I, I'm interested too. Now, not to like, because this could be a whole podcast. Of own, so <laughs> yeah. I don't want to change it too far down here. But in ancient myth writing, and so again, we're talking about writing, not, not right. necessarily books, but the kind of content that would be in a book if it was written today. Yes. In ancient cultures, they they wrote things that kind of um, straddled the boundary line between fiction and reality. Good so. Point. So they, so, so they oftentimes wrote, um, in what we, what we might call myth, but unfortunately today, a lot of times we use the word myth and, and we mean something like false, like fairy tale, um, in scholarly work, that's not what the word myth means. Myth, myth has to do with, um, with, with, with stories that may not necessarily be, um, historically true, but they they are purposeful. They teach something mm -hmm. deeper and mean something deeper. And, and you had some ancient cultures who there's a real debate about it. For example, there are a lot of people who, like I said, totally different discussion, but there are a lot of people who, who uh, want, actually want to cast shade on, uh, for example, the, the Bible, because they look at other ancient Near Eastern cultures uh, from, you know, like the Mesopotamia and the ancient Babylonians and, and things like that. And, and you see, um, some similarities, but also a lot of huge differences in the different styles of writing. And, and so you have myths like the, you know, Enuma Elish, where you've got these gods who are warring, and it turns out that like the ocean is part of the body of this, of, or the sky rather, is, is part of the body of, of this ancient god named Tiamat who was defeated. And, and you have some people, some scholars, who would argue that, yes, those ancient people actually believed that that story was real. And then you have other people who believe that, no, they knew it wasn't like real, but it was part of their, it was part of their ancient, what they call etiology. So etiology yeah. means the origin of like uh, a people group. So it's just interesting how like, and this will get into what we talk about next week as well, a little bit. Yeah. So I don't want to, I don't want to, but, but that's the point, right? Is in this writing, you've got, you've got straight up fiction, you've got straight up nonfiction. And then, especially in ancient times, you've got these things that sort of straddle the, the boundary between the two. Yeah, it's an interesting point, especially since um, cultures back then, I, I, I guess I would say every culture back then really kind of, um, I guess, realized is, is the right word that you had, um, you know, the mythos of mythology and spiritual world. And then you also had the physical world and it was, you know, it all just kind of bridged the gap together into one. And so when you yeah. add those stories, like what I'm just kind of reiterating what you said, but it kind of blurs the line between what they thought was real or versus what was just applicable to their lives. And, but a lot of it was really just based in, you know, what they thought was true or at least beholden to, you know, actuality and the universe and how things, you know, really behave really interesting. Yeah, for, for sure. Now, now I guess maybe to make a more practical point here before we move on to the next thing, is this is something that I'm thinking about right now in my mm -hmm. regular experience is, so I have a lot of books and I have a bad habit well it i guess it just depends uh, so Am amazon has made it really easy now <laughs> to if there is an audible version so i buy most of my books on kindle yeah. and when you buy a kindle book if there is an audible version of yeah. the book as well it is a simple check mark to say get the audible version as well and it's always at a deep discount it's like seven six or seven dollars at the most to yeah. get the audible version too and so for and when I say I buy a lot of books, I mean, I buy a lot of books and almost every one of them, I find myself also buying the audible version. And so I have all these books and I've been, I've been buying a lot lately. And, um, I, I, I find myself in this regular struggle because, and we're going to talk about podcasts later, but I, I historically have been a huge podcast listener and, and learn a lot from podcasts. But what I appreciate about books specifically, and this is why I wanted to tie that in is that there when you have a book you get to see 
for whatever point the author is trying to make. Now, that same author might have a podcast, but you're not going to get the same exact level of detail and thought process that you'll get right. in that author's book because he's going to start at the very beginning. He or she is going to start at the very beginning, is going to lay out the issues, is going to lay out the central thesis, and is going to arguably give you more information than you need to know. But if you're the kind of person who really wants to understand the supporting logic behind ideas, and I am, I don't want, just want the yeah. ideas. Right. I want why does the idea work? Because I may disagree with you in your motives for thinking something. And I, I can even explain a specific scenario just recently with that. But anyway, um, it's like, I, I, I like to read the books because you get that deeper logic. However, the book is a bigger investment of time uh, and, and mental resources. And so a lot of times I find myself opting to just listen to a podcast or scroll Facebook <laughs> instead because the book takes so much investment of time and, and thought and resources, at least in the when you start talking about nonfiction, which is mostly what I, what I read, I don't know if you have any thoughts yeah. on that. Yeah, no, I definitely do. So I definitely, obviously my line is kind of more fiction geared towards that side, yeah. but that's not to say, of course, you know, that I, I enjoy a lot of topics that are nonfiction based, whether it has to do with health or space or theology or even some philosophy at certain times and just a whole variety of different issues and just balancing out my time, I usually resort to podcasts when it has to do with me learning something or about a certain subject. And typically it involves not necessarily someone instructing, but it involves sometimes a debate, but usually it's two people with different views who get along well and are just talking about a subject. And I just get so much out of a three hour long form podcast than investing 10 to 15 hours in a book because I don't have the time. Yeah, that's, that's fair. And I was just thinking too, it's, it's so interesting, like the concept of, um, this is going to be a big word, but, but the concept of ca canonization yes. um, and, and authority, it's interesting. Like I just heard the other day about a story of a person whose podcast has been affected as, or not, not affected, but accepted as, um, it counts as official, like continuing education credits for this particular vertical that, that, that she was in. And yeah. I can't remember what it, what it was. And it's, it's having published three um, books on Amazon myself and self-publishing, I find it really interesting that it's only, it's only marginally more difficult to publish on, on Kindle, for example, um, or even Audible is not that hard, but, it, but it's, it's only marginally more difficult to get published on Kindle than it is to, to set up your own podcast. And yet, like when you are the author of a book, by, by golly, for, you could, you could write 300 blog articles. And the minute that you write a book, even if it's just a collation and editing of those blog articles, it's like you have more, more authority. So I guess for me to wrap up my end of say, of talking about books and writing, it's just interesting how important they are in our society for, for those many different reasons. Not the least of which being that they convey, um, they convey authority and just respect. I mean, if you write a fiction book, let's yeah, talk fiction. Absolutely. if you write a fiction book, like. It, even if it like you're gonna get respect for having just oh yeah you that. just said yeah I wrote a book yeah yeah because it, it's a huge credit so my, my last thought is just well I guess too is it's funny we just barely scratched the surface on just books and the effect they have on society I mean this could be a ten to twenty hour long podcast just on writing and how it affects everyone and how it's affected people in the past and the only other thing is um I've tried listening to audiobooks some of them. I've done pretty well with, I could follow along. Like I think, uh, Andy Serkis does a good job with the Lord of the Rings ones, but I've found that when I try to listen to a book, especially one that's instructional or nonfiction, um, I'll listen and then my mind will just go different places and I can't focus. And it's just, I'm, I wish that I could do listen more, but I just, my mind just zips. It doesn't happen with that in podcasts, maybe because it's more conversational. I feel like I'm a part of it, but, um, yeah, it, you know what? Our next one, our next one was, um, I think uh, just a nice segue would be going into podcast next. If you want yeah, to talk about that, that, just because we were just kind of discussing it. Yeah. Um, so even though we already talked about it a little bit just now, um, I, man, ever since, I guess it was, I know podcasts have been around a lot longer than this, but it really wasn't until about three years ago, maybe that I really got into listening to podcasts a lot and man, yeah, just the wealth of um, just knowledge. And even if like, if, even if there's a subject where say it's a controversial subject, let's just say 
let's just say it's about, you know, a religion, you know, it, you know, is Christianity true or is it not? Even though that hasn't changed my mind about my faith and what I believe, I've still learned so much about hearing like a Christian talk with an atheist or a Christian talk with a Muslim or even a Muslim talk with an atheist and just, just so many different viewpoints and just understanding other people's worldview and where they come from. And then taking it to even less serious subjects, like uh, learning a lot about say, not saying it's not serious, but um, like uh, crime in the United States or what type of, you know, you know, laws should be implemented for, you know, drug control. And I mean, just the plethora of things. And it was actually just kind of how it um, affected me, especially relating to stories is it was last summer that two different podcasts really affected me, how I saw like my health and my motivation to really get into, try to get into running again. I still need to do better with that. But it all came from podcasts. Um, one of them was Zach Bitter, and he just told a story about his journey about running. And then he broke the world record for the farthest, yeah, the longest amount of miles run in 12 hours. And then the fastest hundred miler ever run. Um, and just, just it, those inspiring stories. And it made me just, you know, kind of get sucked into that. So just a lot of stuff where podcasts have really been super beneficial to me of just with the wealth of knowledge and motivation, inspiration to, to do. Yeah. Oh man, that's so good. Um, well, I, it would be, it would be super hard for me to, um, overstate the effect of, of podcasting in general on my life. Um, I, I guess it, <laughs> Uh, and I hate to sound like really, I don't know, grandiose or even maybe a little <laughs> emotional about that. Um, but it is very legitimately true, both in terms of now I've been producing podcasts of some sort since late 2017. The first time I ever recorded a podcast was on the issue as a creationist of radiometric dating of all things, sitting at my kitchen table. Um, that was the first podcast I ever recorded. And I, across multiple different shows, have hundreds of episodes out now um in the internet ether and and before that of course i had been an avid listener to podcasts for quite a few years so at the time i was uh i was employed i, I wasn't much of a podcast listener uh before i became employed um at the law firm where i used to work i, I worked in it and really as soon as i got into christian apologetics um my and a little bit of online business that's where sort of my first forte into podcasting came out I'll, I'll never forget the first podcast ever that i really listened to uh i still listen to it today um uh, mostly for nostalgia believe it or not yeah. an active podcast they have over 400 episodes now nice and it's it's a command control power and it's a yeah. podcast by three apple consultants because when yeah. i first started my business I started it as an Apple consultancy because I wanted to help people fix their Mac computers. Now today it's a digital marketing agency, but that's yeah. not what it started as. And um, I just love those guys and how they, you know, how they talk about the technology and stuff. And it's just, I don't know, it, it was a super niche podcast, but um, because of, because I'm so, and that's actually another point about podcasting, a feather in its cap is that you can get it so attached hmm. to the actual podcast person behind the microphone Absolutely. that it doesn't even matter in some cases what they're talking about um you can find them in one domain and then um find that you're interested in what they have to say about something else and yep. believe it or not this is actually and again we could do a whole episode on podcasting uh, uh yes just talking about my angle you know but but for me it's like some some of you may know i know alex knows um but um, some of you may not know, I actually have five active podcasts right now and two YouTube channels. And y'all are thinking, dude, this guy's crazy. And uh, the answer yes, is, yes, I am. <laughs> yes, yeah. um, yes, I am. However, I'm, I'm literally, and one of my podcasts is, it's only a monthly one and it's called the podcast marketing experiment. And the point is that I am in the middle of an experiment, um, across a different, you know, a, 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 a broad sort of swath of podcasts where I'm talking about different things. And I actually have more podcasts planned um, across even different areas. But right now I'm just, I'm trying to, you know, stay consistent on these ones that I'm doing. And, um, and, and so, right, the, the whole logic of it is, well, 
if somebody finds me over here on this podcast, but they get interested in me and what I have to say, maybe they'll maybe they'll follow that breadcrumb over here to this podcast. Yeah. And the goal would be to get them following me on the on the onto the breadcrumb, at least the ones to whom it is relevant yeah. of marketing. And they'll listen to my flagship marketing podcast, and that's where I call them to action to become a customer of mine eventually, or at least an yeah. email subscriber or something. So there is a method to my uh, to my madness, but but podcasting has has I mean I've listened to thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of hours of podcasts. I listen on two times speed, which um, there are a couple podcasts too specifically that I have to dial down to one and a half times yeah. speed, or I can't get through it. Uh, I have to start doing that. Fast. I just never even think to to speed it up. I just don't think to do that, and I need to. Yeah, I, I mean, it's set to default now on on my Overcast app that I use, and uh, I mean, I pay for the premium Overcast app. It's it's yeah. I mean, podcasting has. I don't. I'll just plug this and I'll let you you talk about it a little bit more. But I, it has changed my life dramatically. Has changed my life um, because I have learned so 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 much from listening to podcasts um, that uh, I'll be forever grateful for for having that platform. <laughs> Oh, and a lot of, there's a lot of people that listen to podcasts and not just podcasts, but like very educational and knowledgeable ones. I mean, even ones like we'll look at Joe Rogan, even though his is kind of fun and kind of silly and he has some weird guys on there sometimes. Think about just all the knowledgeable people he has on there. I mean, and that's where I heard my two with, um, as far as like health and fitness and everything, I just, I just learned a lot. Um. You kind of hit on something I think that's really important is specifically the niche podcast where I, it's no surprise to me that um, some colleges are recognizing podcasts for college credits. I th there's been so many podcasts and like really cheap online courses, a little bit separate category, but on Udemy, um, they have really cheap courses where I learned to do programming and art and a little bit of music composition that I want to get into more. And I've spent less than a hundred bucks on there and I've earned more than I probably would have in two or three semesters out of college. Um, yeah. it just, if this is a perfect time to live, if you are a motivated person and want to do something because mm -hmm. the knowledge is out there for you. Like, man, if you, I mean, I, it was out there to a lesser extent when I was in high school, but if you're a high school kid and you got motivation, you're 15, 16 and want to start a business, oh, man. Where you, I yes. mean, you can, so cool. Get, on, on, and I'll say this isn't maybe recommend it for everyone, but skip college, like really like learn to do something with yourself and you know, when you can do mm -hmm. it, um, it's just a crazy, just a crazy, uh, situation where that people have access to whatever they want to learn about. Yeah, that's, that's right. And, and just some interesting stuff from the, you know, quickly from the, from the marketing and business angle on yeah. podcasting is, um, podcasting is unique in that it cannot be reasonably compared um, to other mediums. So for example, uh, and I actually, it's so ironic. I, I did uh, my podcast marketing experiment episode for the month was, was today. I recorded it today and I recorded it on basically the benefit, some of the benefits of podcasting, yep. but just, just two quick things I'll mention is that with a podcast, you don't need a huge audience because, because the listeners to the podcast will stay with you for a while. And there are more committed, different kind of listener. So you might have 5,000 views on a YouTube video and not see as much, um, I mean, depending on how you've defined success and, and traction yeah. and whatever you're doing, you, your 50 podcast listeners might be more valuable than 5,000 YouTube views. And so it really puts it into perspective there. Um, YouTube is actually a great way to help boost the you know, a podcast, as long as you're being sensitive and friendly to the, to the fact that they're different mediums, you have to respect the mediums because YouTube viewers oftentimes expect something different than podcast listeners do. So if you're going to do both, you have to really kind of be, um, sensitive to that. Yep. But the point still stands that you can't compare them directly. The other interesting thing, and this is a directly, you know, just a marketing, um, tidbit for you is that the average podcast listener makes more than a hundred thousand dollars per year. There are more affluent audience. So on YouTube, you're <laughs> usually getting like how to content that a lot of times it's your DIY person yeah. who is going to watch that. Your, your average podcast listener from again, from a business angle, your average podcast listener is more of an entrepreneur 
more looking for more looking for strategy and deep conversation about how to do things and uh, are more affluent they have more money to spend so while there is a trick in number one gaining reach for podcasts we've talked about that i think a little bit before but it's really hard to market podcasts yeah um and, and, and you do have to, it's also very difficult to get people to leave the medium. For example, if you want somebody to just directly come buy your thing, it's hard to do that from a podcast because they're usually not in a situation where they can just pick up their, their device and, and, yeah. and click They're gardening or they're driving or whatever yeah, while right. they're listening. So it has to be really com compelling and, and it has to be maybe a little bit more of a, like, for example, if I was recording an episode about, um, uh, about the five things you need to do to spruce up your email marketing game. Okay, if if I if I told you if the call to action at the end of that podcast was go buy my email marketing course, probably not going to be very successful. But if the call to action was, hey, go download my checklist that goes along with this episode that'll give you fill in the blank things for the for the five things I'm going to give you, and it's also going to give you an additional five things that you have to know. One of them made me an extra $10,000 last year. If yeah. that's the call to action, you are going to go to whatever, stevestram.com slash download this stinking thing because you because you need it to accompany the podcast episode. Mm -hmm. So it's harder to do, um, and or not harder, it's just a little bit different mindset. But when you can do that, podcasting becomes a powerful medium to use in your business. Hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I don't, I don't have too much more to say on it. I think we kind of covered it, but it just, yeah, yeah podcast, the, the value that, that I didn't know this app, but it doesn't surprise me about the, the income level, the average of, for the mm -hmm. people that listen to it. It, it makes sense in a way rather than looking at shorts on YouTube or doing other stuff, they're instead trying to bring in as much, even if it's entertaining, you know, learn something and have, you know, it. right listen to intellectual conversations, even if they're not really educational, if they're funny or if they're interesting and just kind of, that's interesting. I didn't realize that. Yeah. Um, cool. Um, awesome. Well, let's go to our next one. Kind of still going out over here, but let's go to videos. Um, specifically kind of thinking like, uh, YouTube, um, and we're kind of breaking out into two different parts here where you have, I guess you could kind of lump podcasts in here a little bit. Um, it'll probably be a little bit of overlap, but you have your YouTube long form conversations, whether maybe it's a 10 minute snippet of a, um, conversation that Sam Harris had with Jordan Peterson or something. Um, mm -hmm. I know it's a lot of it's, even though it's not a podcast, you still have a lot of long form videos that are taken from podcasts or interviews or shows. That's and those right. are kind of, and those are very popular, especially ones that, you know, this person owns this person or this person argues with yeah. this person. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And then of course you have your, your other one where you have your short clips and those can be great too. I know that, um, is it, is it Sean McDowell? Is that his name? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, he does, he's an, if for those of you who don't know him, I think he's a pastor evangelist, I guess, just generally speaking. And, um, just, I think he puts out at least one short every day, maybe even two or three. Um, 40, 50 seconds long, just explaining a topic that people bring to about the Bible and, um, half the, I'd say over half the time, there's some pretty tough questions that he kind of addresses, um, does a good job with it. And so shorts are, I kind of look at two different ways, effective way at, you know, getting down to quick information and that's very helpful. And then you also have your kind of rabbit hole shorts that are funny or interesting and fun fact about space. And so those are kind of the two different two different subjects that are, I, I would think are the most popular on YouTube, I would think. Yeah. Well, even transcending YouTube, I mean, I, you know, think about TikTok and yeah, now, exactly. now in, Instagram reels. I mean, yep. you know, I mean, there's times where, where, you know, people in our family and, and my friends, yeah, I mean, they'll spend hours a day scrolling <laughs> through TikTok videos. Now yeah. I can't personally, I, th I've only found one person in all the time that reels and TikTok and all that. Well, maybe two. I think I found two people whose videos that I really like to watch. I don't, I don't, I can't just do like the mindless scroll through the short video thing, but I do know a lot of people who do that and, and it's entertaining for them. And it's, I don't mean it in a judgmental way at all. It, I think it's fine. It's just, it's, it's, it's a it's different the, form of entertainment. It is. It's the yeah. world we live in right now, and it's it's a hot thing. And there's a reason why everybody, including YouTube, has jumped on the bandwagon. I mean, short video is here. Yeah, um, I like I like to watch three hour long movies, even though 
they're just for entertainment. Yeah. Some people like to scroll. I mean, there's no difference between that and scrolling to watch funny videos for two, three hours a day. I mean, really. That, that's no, that's that. I don't watch a movie every day, but. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. And, you know, and it's, it's interesting. So I'm reading a book right now that I, I, we need to offline talk about it a little bit because yep. there's some interesting concepts in it. Um, I'm reading a book right now called 4,000 Weeks by Ol Oliver Berkman. And it is a, it's sort of like the, uh, the anti-productivity book, uh, if I, mm -hmm. if I can put it that way. So he's, um, it's a, it, it's kind of like a former productivity node, uh, or, or excuse me, former productivity nerd talking about how, um, you know, embracing limits and embracing constraints and time only management for mortals, <laughs> time management for mortals is the subtitle. That's, that's correct. That's cool. And, um, and it's, it's. It's it's just so it's just so interesting um, some of the things that he is uh, talking about with regard to how we're willing to spend our time and and how we how we what we choose to spend our time doing and or don't spend our time doing and um, so as, as it relates to like the the shorts and and things like that I mean there are definitely people who have fallen in love with that medium. Me personally, I'm, I, you know, again, I'm not, I'm not the biggest fan of it because I like that more long form, right? That more substantive, um, um, you know, kind of, kind of content, but you do have to be careful. And the reason I brought his book up is because he made a really good point, actually a really sobering point. And, and you, you might've experienced this as well, but do you ever just maybe a little bit less because fiction, but especially with nonfiction books, um, you can hardly read a few pages before getting the urge to pull out your phone mm -hmm. and, and, and go to Facebook or go to something else. And I did it today, even having, literally, I read this part of Oliver's book last night. And even today, I was watching a YouTube video. I was watching a YouTube video. And this is the reason I'm making this point now is because it's even in YouTube videos and stuff. I mean, I can barely make it through a 10 minute YouTube video without opening another tab on my browser and, and. <laughs> I've had and, four and, or five tabs open before. See, see, yeah. I mean, and, and, and I mean, me too. Like, but like, it's like, oh, like, okay, well, yeah. It's like the, the multitasking mindset or whatever is like so ingrained now that while I'm watching a video, it's like, oh yeah, well, this little compartment over here in my mind that I'm not using, I could, I could check to see if this email has come in yet that I was expecting with that. Or I could see if anybody commented on my Facebook post. And of course the point that, that the book is making is that this is like, this is, this is a, this is a bad diagnosis. Like it's, yeah. it's not, it's not okay. Actually, like this is one of those things that just because it's happening, you know, it's like, oh, this is just the way the world's going. No, that is not okay. Like, it, we need to get our focus back when we're doing things. Yep. And, um, and yeah. that is a, uh, if I may real quick, yeah, that is a, you know, you're good. A, a big difference between like, like podcasting, like you're almost already doing something else while you're listening to podcasts in almost I mean, in, in, in many cases, yeah, right. so the podcast, can, whatever you're doing tends to be more mindless. That's why you can listen to the podcast because you occupy your mind with that. But when you're watching a YouTube video or something, you know, you have to be keeping people's attention because it's so easy for them to click off and go somewhere else. Yeah. I remember before I really got more into, um, listening to podcasts and focusing more on like efficiency and, uh, and like deep focus and everything. Um, I remember I was like, I got I got to delete, um, just like the Facebook app from my phone. This is like three mm -hmm. or four years ago. And I remember I deleted it in the morning and two minutes later, I was, I went to the tab of my phone to click on it out of habit and it wasn't there. And I thought, wow, like I was just going to Facebook literally out of habit. I was checking right. emails or the weather and then yep. I didn't put my phone down. I went right to it and it just hit me like, wow, like my my brain had been rewired to constantly go yep. back and look at Facebook. And it was, yep. it was kind of scary in a way where I'm just how much time wasted. So one thing that, another thing that really helped too, for, for that was looking at, um, the time spent on my phone, the hours, um, for certain things. And that yeah. kind of was a, was an eye opener. Um, but yeah, I, I kind of relating it back to like the videos and stuff, long form, short form and. You, I guess, kind of focusing on the social media aspect of it, whether it's a Facebook stories, Instagram stories, or YouTube shorts, or even just YouTube videos in general, the five, 10 minute videos is, um, 
you can learn some stuff on those things too, but um, at least in my my opinion, even if it's a good story topics that I'm following, if it's about space or history, I'll just get sucked in. And at the end of it, even if I kind of learn something, I think, man, how does that actually apply to what I want to do in life? That didn't help my um, writing. Yeah, and enough, you so know, good. so there's a lot of knowledge that we man. can learn. Kind of like the saying, learn trivia, people will mistake it for real knowledge. And there is a lot of truth to that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, there, there's a book that I, I, I have, and I've seen it come up a couple times now. And so I'm, I'm really, I'm going to, I need to read it. Um, uh, but it's called how to take smart notes. Have you ever heard of this book? Um, I don't know if I've heard of that book or just the subject matter, but. Well, it seems to be a, you know, almost one of those like, oh yeah, like, like, you know, all the gurus know about this book, but yeah. it, it's not like mainstream, but it's like. Just the the you know what i mean the real nerds know about yeah it. and it's it's like a who's yeah. who kind of thing so it's called how to take smart notes and apparently it's a lot more than that like if you read the reviews it's basically just like how to it's a lot about how to write in in general but like again the the main thrust of the book is is how to take smart notes and so i'm just talking out loud a little bit meta about some of this stuff but i'm thinking that um that I may try to create a new habit and maybe this is something that, uh, you know, I don't want to necessarily say, yeah, you should do this or others should do this, but, but I think I'm going to try this. So follow along if you want to. Um, I think I'm going to try when I start watching videos and stuff like that. I, I always, without fail, I have my full focus planner right here. There's no reason why when I start a video, I couldn't as a matter of habit, pull my planner, flip it over. And now I've got the blank side with all, with my notes for the day. And I'll just literally start taking notes, I think, is what I'm going to try to do when I start a video at my computer. Because I'll I'll find out pretty quickly, as we were saying, like whether it's it's worth my time or not. And unless I'm doing it for like pure entertainment purposes and I know I'm watching the video for pure entertainment purposes, then like why am I watching the video? Because it's going to be a waste of my life to sit there and, and watch something that I'm – it's like if I'm watching it, I'm watching it to learn it. And that's the irony or to learn yeah, whatever I'm talking great. about. Yeah. And, and it's like you click off and then you get sucked down an email or a Facebook rabbit trail. And then 10 minutes later, the video has been playing in the background and you have no idea what they've been talking about. So now yeah. you have to rewire Pretty the video hard. and it happens all over again. I'm, I'm so ashamed to admit how long, how much yeah. it has happened to me. It, so maybe note taking during the video is what we need to do. I don't know. And um, on the flip side of it, even like the long form podcasts that are very educational can do the same thing to you. I remember I was listening to too many, the Joe Rogan podcasts. And even though I was learning a lot and it was really interesting subjects, I just realized like, man, it's, it's just too much. Like a lot of the subject matter is interesting, but it just doesn't apply to what I'm going to be doing in life or what I want to do. And my time can be spent better elsewhere. So now I really just try to, even with podcasts and learning, try to pick and choose what ones I listen to. But yeah. And, um, and, and there is this, this, this concept too, of what's called just in time learning. Um, there's just in time computing and all, all kinds yeah. of different things, but, but just in time learning is this concept of only learning, only focusing your content consumption on the particular thing that you need to be learning at a given time. Yeah. And I'm so bad at that, but I, I, while I say I'm bad at that, I also, um, I, I also do a lot of times realize that if I were just to open my podcast app and, and I have a most recent playlist where where basically that's mostly what I listen to is just the podcasts in order of when they came out. And I, I exclude some of my, like my podcasts where I'm binging them. I exclude those and yeah. just my current ones. I keep on that most recent list. And, um, I, uh, it's like, if I know that like the next few episodes on that are not like really relevant at all to where I'm at in my life or they're going to be a distraction, I will go ahead and wait until I feel like things have slowed down a little bit before I continue through my list. So I've at least gotten to that point, but I need to get better even still about, about yeah, just digging in and just in time learning for the, for the step that I'm at right now in what I'm doing. So it's a huge one, thing. One thing that has really improved my efficiency and motivation for writing is before I write, I'll listen to um, writing excuses, like a 15 minute episode with Brandon Sanderson. And it just gets you in that mindset. Yeah. Rather than like, even yeah. rather than listening to music or listening to something else when you're kind of in that mindset, yep, yeah, it helps. That's a huge idea. Yeah. Totally agree with that. Um, all right, let's move on. Um, let's go back up now to music. Um, yeah, it's music will be uh, a good one for Steve and I in a couple different ways. Steve is a, uh, renowned musician in the uh 
oh. and the Southern uh, gospel, bluegrass gospel, whatever you want to call it. Uh, Renowned. Renowned. Uh, <laughs> I see you at church strumming that bass. <laughs> yeah. I've had, I've had my 15 seconds, but that's about it. <laughs> so well, whereas Steve, um, obviously loves music too, and has, um, is a definitely a talented musician to say the least. I, um, I have not learned how to play an instrument, but, um, my love for music is still uh, a very, um, very passionate of mine in my life that I, uh, enjoy very much. So this will be a yeah. interesting, um, subject, I think, uh, for me, um, obviously, and it's, I mean, pretty much. I'd say nearly everyone you talk to would say they love music in some form or way. Um, I know that a couple, one of the main ways that it relates to me as far as for storytelling goes, I kind of touched on it in the last podcast with envisioning different scenes that I write is there are quite a few songs that when I listen to, or I'll purposely listen to, to envision a story in my head about what I want to tell. Um, just, you know, the feeling that it gives and, um, a lot of times it's even more the feeling than the words, and then the words will come second to it. And, um, it just helps me envision certain scenes that I want to write and an overall feeling that I want to achieve while I'm writing the book. It almost makes me wish that I could, when people read what I write, they could also listen to the music that I heard as well while I, while I was writing that. Um, and so, yeah, that's, uh, it's kind of, um, as far as how it relates to storytelling. Um, and then I, I think another thing too, that music does, um, for me is. Um, I get, we probably go through stages in our life where we listen to certain music at certain times and I'll put in a band that I had listened to in 10 years and it'll take me right back to certain memories that I made from 10 years ago. Not even anything like big, just, um, for instance, an example is Sanctus Real. They were a band that I really got into a lot 10, 15 years ago. Well, specifically when I got my license and every time I listened to the same album, I just remember in the springtime, driving to school with the windows down and listening to that music, nothing important, nothing special, but it just kind of puts you in that time and place. So just those two things in my personal life, and then just a plethora of other areas where, um, it can really music obviously elicits emotions, but also, um, makes you think of stories that have happened in the past in your life and can, you know, help you visualize things. And uh, music is a very powerful medium for conveying emotion and stories. Yeah, for certain. And I've, I've got a few things I want to talk about with this, but, yep. but definitely to hook on to, to one of yours is, is, is memorability. Yep. Um, and, and just in multiple ways, it's like, uh, good memories and bad. I mean, it's, it's like, I have, uh, there's an album. I, so I used to love some 41 growing up and one of their albums is just really hard for me to listen to because it was like, I remember listening to it driving to the hospital when it was like getting close to the end for my grandfather. Mm. And, um, it's like, so it just, unfortunately it brings back bad memories yeah. but also good memories because i remember loving the music and it you know it kind of you know in a sense being there for me um also uh, so music actually helps and this is an interesting one with scripture memorization so there are a, there are a few um uh apps that you can download that are along the the theme of sing scripture and you yeah. can actually hear scripture that's been put to music and, um, it really truly does help you actually remember it a lot easier than just, you know, trying to, 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 to strong arm your way through the memorization process, because I'm actually very terrible. And this might surprise some people just given how, like what, how they know me to be, but I'm actually terrible at memorization. I, especially like scripture memorization. I'm awful at it. Yeah. We're in this deep boat with that. Yep. I mean, and it's like, yeah. I, I mean, it's like, I thought you were the, uh, you know, Bible nerd. Like one of my podcasts is the Bible nerd. Bi well, you know, guess what? I am, but I, I, I just yeah. can't recall it off the top of my head. Like other people can, and it's yeah. just, I don't know. It's, it's crazy. So definitely just the power as a medium that music has to, to cement ideas in people's mind. That's something you got to think about. I mean, it's totally worth, um, investing in i mean it's like you're you, what you were saying with fiction using it as a, as a way to sort of convey that feeling and that emotion for readers I, I i mean it's like i listen right now i'm looking at the dark knight movie score on my apple music because that's mm -hmm. what i listen you know i listen to uh, yeah. lots of movie scores and things when i'm working yeah. um because they in a sense transport my mind to another another world and and allow me to focus on what i'm truly working on um at the same time really enjoy 
what's going on in the background. So, um, so that's something fascinating. Um, uh, of course, there's the hardcore for me storytelling part of it, and, and so, um, I mean, this is a story podcast, and yes, and, and growing up uh, in the in the in the particular kind of music that I did is a little different than others. And what I mean by that is um, because I'm exposed, I've been exposed to, of course, all the same music. I mean, I'm a normal person, right? I listen to, you know, I was, I just, I have a, 41. I mean, I normal listen. is a stretch. Normal is a stretch. Yeah, it might be a stretch. Okay. It might be a stretch, but actually, acclimated to human, to humanity. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, as it relates to music, I feel like I can, I can hold my own in a conversation about most, you know, yeah you know, bands, especially like, you know, bands growing up in the nineties and early two thousands yeah. and stuff. Um, maybe not so much today, but, um, and, and, and so I've heard a lots of different kinds of music and, and I just have to be honest, I don't, I don't know of another kind of music that is as good at, at straight up storytelling as what I grew up playing. Right. So I played bluegrass gospel music, um, for about six years with the Easter brothers and they were known as some of just the greatest songwriting storytellers of all time. I mean, honestly, in, in that, I mean, certainly in that genre um, of, of, of music and in Christian music writ large, I mean, the name, the name Easter has a lot of, you know, clout or whatever you might want to say in, in that, in the music industry there um, for that reason. I mean, because the, the songs are just so timeless and, and they all tell a good story. And, um, it's just so, I don't know, like I, there, there's a, like, for example, there's a song called Grandma's House or, or, um, is it Grandma's House? So come on in, come on in and sit. We called it the Grandma Song. Yeah. Sorry. We, we called it the Grandma Song. Um, and it, it just told this wonderful story about days gone by and, you know, what it used to be like and, and things. And it's like some of the modern sort of, more metaphorical storytelling where you don't really know what they're talking about. Perfect example. I love the Foo Fighters. We talked about them recently because of Taylor Hawkins. So I came across this YouTube video of, of Dave Grohl being interviewed by Kelly Clarkson. And what they were doing was they were talking about snippets of, of song lyrics. And Kelly was talking about what those particular lyrics meant to her. And then Dave was kind of reflecting as the writer of those lyrics on, you know, what they meant and giving feedback or whatever. And, you know, first they covered um, Everlong, the chorus of Everlong, One Little. Oh, what a great you know, song. Oh it, is a, it is a fantastic song. Okay. And, and he was like, yeah, I was in love. Like, what, can I, what else can I say? Like, that was the, um, that was what it meant. I mean, but then, but then. So they were talking about learn to fly and, and the first little bit of the chorus of learn to fly goes looking for the sky to save me, looking yeah. for a sign of life, looking for someone to help me make things right. And, and Kelly was talking about how it was this deep, like transformative experience for her or, or, or whatever like that really meant something to her. And, and, and he was like, well, I hate to burst your bubble, but honestly, I wanted to be a pilot. <laughs> <laughs> she, literally, she literally like screams and like gets up from the couch and like runs across the set on on on, on her show. It's and funny though uh, how um that's one great thing about music though how um even though a song might not be anything about what you want it to be it could affect you totally in a different way. Exactly. To and two yeah two um examples kind of what you were saying um you know the or have you heard of the band Def Cab for Cutie? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so uh, I think they were around mid nineties, I guess. And their first album, um, <laughs> they, uh, it was very, I guess poetics, not really the word, very abstract. That'd probably be the word. Um, oh, yeah. yeah. It, there's a, there's a few really great songs there that I like. don't know what it means, but I liked it. And I heard an interview <laughs> of the lead singer. I can't recall his name right now. And they asked him about his first album. He said, yeah, he said, I can't tell you what any of those songs mean. Like. He said, I just don't know. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. it, it, so you're trying to extract stuff, but then there's another, um, uh, band recently that, um, they're, uh, uh they're a metal band and one song was just, you know, really exciting and interesting. It's called song about James. And it's literally just about a guy named James, who is a contestant on Jeopardy and how about answering yeah. questions. And it's like such a fun, catchy song and it's great. And it's just yeah. long about nothing, really. Just something that's so yeah, lackluster. Something. Just funny stuff like that where as long as come up sometimes. 
Well, and I guess, you know, I mean, I guess to, to be fair, it is, it is very preferential. And I mean, obviously you've got, right. I mean, that, that song learn to fly, like just to mm -hmm. keep on that example was yep. a huge song for the Foo Fighters. And I mean, it turns out that the dude wanted to be a pilot. So I don't know. It's just, it's really interesting. And, and I, I maybe I'm a little biased, uh, like with the Easter's and stuff, for example, but I just feel like when I, maybe it's just because I'm old and crusty or whatever, but when I'm listening to a song and like, I want to understand what the lyrics actually meant to the person who wrote it. And, um, I feel like I get that in that sort of, in that sort of bluegrass gospel, like, like where it's just, it's meaning, it's actually meaning to tell stories for posterity's sake, right. For the preservation of the, of the, of the event or the time period or whatever. To me, that's really interesting because it, it's the truest form of, I think, yeah. you know, storytelling in music that, that you can get. And um, the, um, I mean, I mean, really just thinking off the top of my head of, um, like songs that have really, that, you know, really kind of affect me the most, whether it's emotionally or like, you know, getting my mind in a particular way are, um, artists and bands where their songs are very clear about what they mean in it, yeah. and it does tell a somewhat story that from a Christian perspective, uh, the one that I always think of the most is casting crowns, their songs, yes. are, every single oh, one of their songs are, so um, it, they hit home every single one of them. And That's so right. we usually, when I'm like, kind of like, you know what, I just want to listen to music about, you know, Jesus, I, I, it's usually cast a crown as my go-to because that's, it, that's yeah. what it is. And then, um, another artist I just think of, um, new and popular NF, um, he's a rapper, but he's a Christian artist and, um, especially he's very big with his music videos too. And every single one of them tells a story and just, just direct and you know what he's talking about and that there's no, you know going around the bushes with it. Um, it's, those are the songs that tend to hit the hardest, um, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the last really quick point I'll make on music. Then yeah. Go for it. On, it, it. It's just that it's universal. The, it's the, the language of music is universal. I mean, you could get, you could get four guys in a room who each speak a different language, playing a different instrument and instantaneously they will get along because that language, that language can be spoken and they will make a beautiful song, even not being able to communicate with each other. Um, and, and that, I don't know. That's just power. I mean, to me that, that in itself tells a story. I mean, I don't know what else to say about it. That, that is a yeah. special thing. Music's it's, it's a, it's really a beautiful thing. I mean, it just, it brings people together. Um, and it yeah. just, even, um, you know, just going to a concert, um, a concert where there's not a Christian band playing, it's, it's a whatever band. The people that are there, it doesn't matter who they voted for, for president, who, you know, their specific beliefs on the Bible are, belief. you know, it's just yep. like, yep. I went to a concert a couple of weeks ago, there were 600 people there. There wasn't a single person fighting or arguing or discussions, or it was just everyone's there and together and, you know, let's enjoy the moment and let's just have fun. And it's just, and isn't it, isn't it so powerful. weird? Listen to this. Isn't this so crazy how that can be the reality. And yet at the same time. You, your family will get around the dinner at thanks at, at get around the table at Thanksgiving dinner and beat each other up over stinking politics. And yet you can put 600 people in the room with God knows what they all believe. But when they're in the room for that two hours, listening to something that they enjoy that is similar, yep. it, like none of that stuff matters all it, of a sudden. Uh, and it's that nuts. I don't I know. Think, something I think about, about that, that all the time. It's, it's crazy. But yeah. anyway, that's a, uh, I could pause for thought there for five or 10 minutes, but let's keep yeah. moving on. Moving on yeah. <laughs> yeah. So our next one, um, movies, um, honestly, that's a pretty straightforward one. Both Steve and I are huge movie fans, but it's funny cause the, all of the, however many, you know, dozens of dozens of movies that, uh, probably hundreds of movies Steve has seen, I've probably seen 10% of them and vice versa. All the movies that I've seen, Steve yep. has probably seen 10% of them, but, um, but yeah. we both love movies though. And I guess, you know, television um, shows too, but, um, but yeah, movies are great because it kind of, it kind of culminates a lot of stuff. You have music and then you have the yeah. visuals and you have the acting. And so it's a, it's, it's a pretty much near perfect, you know, form of art of storytelling. Obviously a movie is a story. If you don't have a story, then it's a sucky movie. So, exactly. I mean, you have to tell yeah. the story in a movie. Um, and so, I mean, I, I mean, I don't yeah. think that you, you don't have to search too deep for movies that, you know, elicit emotions by the stories that they tell both fiction and non-fictional. Yeah, that, no, that, that's a hundred percent, uh, 
Right. And of course, you know, <laughs> for me, I, I just have to uh, um, throw a little bit of a monkey wrench in it. So uh -oh. um, I do completely agree with everything you just said. I mean, movies are pretty straightforward. Like it's, it's, it is, it is one of the most universal natural forms of fiction, especially here in America. I mean, yeah. it is, you know, but with that said, I am interested in this, this trend where, and I'm going to try my best to word this in a way that makes sense, but um, a, to, to just kind of start with something concrete, the Oscars, for example, obviously there was a crazy thing that happened at the Oscars <laughs> recently where yeah. Will Smith slaps Chris Roth over this comment that Chris made, okay? And um, if you don't know the story, I mean, this the two-second version is Chris is a comedian. He sees Jada Pinkett Smith in the in the front row with shaved head, makes a G.I. Jane 2 joke ha without any idea that she has a mental condition called alopecia where you lose your hair. Had no idea about that. Made a joke. Will Smith reacts hysterically laughing. And then you see Jada with this That's awful so look on her face. And then so suddenly bad. Will turns sour, goes up slaps the fire out of Chris in front of God and everybody. And um, he he actually, I don't know if you saw this, he resigned his place there in the Oscars or see that. Yeah. You know, whatever. And, yeah, and so that's, anyway, so that's the Oscars. Now, I heard, and I was actually trying to look up the actual numbers right now, um, but uh, I'm not seeing the actual numbers. I do see that, uh, the so the Hollywood Reporter, the little snippet on Google here real quick, says the 2022 Oscars had a sizable uptick in TV viewership, rebounding from all-time lows a year ago. Okay, the reason for the sizable uptick this year may even be obvious at this point, but, <laughs> but last year, let's just take it from this, last year, 2021, there were all-time lows in Oscar, view in Oscar viewership. The Oscars is where they celebrate accomplishments in the movie industry, right? Um, Okay, right. I'm, I'm right about that, right? That I mean, that basically is the yeah, yeah, yes. so, yeah. There's so, another right. one too, but that's like the main yeah. one. Yeah, yeah. Right. That's what I. That's what I thought. Okay. There's the. Is there Academy Awards? The Academy that, Awards. Yeah. Yeah, the Academy Awards. Right. But but these are right. These are basically in in similar veins. So so um, last year there was an all time low. Now my understanding is is like back a few decades ago. The Oscars was like the thing that you lived for, like to watch on TV or whatever. Like, like yeah. movies, especially back in like the fifties and sixties and seventies. Yeah. Like that was life. <laughs> that that was that yeah. right. That was life. Like that basically was entertainment. So with it's just interesting that the the like because that was the thing to do back in the day to like to to look at the Oscars or whatever. Like we we held movie stars on like the the highest pedestal like i'm thinking about uh what's that guy's name was it james not james dean it was one of those other old old, old guys who were yeah. like you know it, it's like that was the pinnacle of stardom and i guess now because because of things like youtube and all where like anybody yeah. can be a star overnight i don't know if that's why but like it's just interesting to me that even though oh and like movie theaters like our movie theater here we had one movie theater in in statesville where we live or where i live and now it's gone um, they closed down and, and that's just interesting to me how the world is changing in that yeah. way. I mean, but movies are still important to humans, but the, it's, it's kind of like the, the, the pizzazz or the, just, I don't know, the glory or whatever of, of being of, of the movies is not like what it used to be. And I, I'm not really sure why, to be honest. Yeah. I think, I think you hit on it big. It's, um, generation, uh, I mean kind of our generation but more so gen z coming up where they have tiktok and they have uh, we had youtube too but there's just kind of differently with their shorts and people that they follow by instagram as well and so they're not really focused on movie stars they don't they just don't care about them it's kind of kind of comparable i guess in a way i always kind of think about it with fashion how people always went to macy's to get their purses or they always had this brand or they always had to have this and now it's like whether you're a male or female oh cool i like that shirt it says something cool about me like i'm gonna wear it because it's it's what i like it's not you have to yeah. do this or go there and so i think it's kind of the same way i think it's for the better just my general opinion and everything whether it comes to we kind of talked about this i don't know like a last week and just very briefly touched on it as far as the popularity of preachers or movie stars or singers yeah. just whenever that can lessen like i'm just happy about it you know let's just appreciate the talent that people have 
and then move on. <laughs> so yeah. I'm all for that. But um, I, but like what you said though, people still love movies and especially TV shows. Um, people go yeah. crazy when Netflix cancels a show, and I can't blame them when it's a good show. Yeah, uh, for sure. Are you familiar with the Dark Crystal movie, the Dark Crystal series on Netflix? Um, I actually just heard about it, ironically, but yeah, I don't know much. Like out of my mouth right now, or <laughs> uh, oh no, 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 no. Actually, I think it. I think. Um, oh, I know what it was. Earlier today, um, one of my one of the movie scores that played in my music that was playing in the background was from the Netflix series. Oh, Dark gotcha. Crystal. And so that's that's where so, I hear, I heard it. Man, it's um I grew up on on the movie and it's the movie is just so beautiful. It's I mean obviously they add like different like CGI stuff and they obviously touch it up with computers, but it's all like film puppets. And so it's puppets and people talking and it's a fantasy really? thing and it's it's incredible. I I forget mm -hmm. they, watching the documentary, I'm gonna botch it, so I'm not even gonna try it. It's just but it was in the the tons talking about weight the tons of moss and grass that they brought in to make the to make the atmosphere in the land for the puppets to to walk in so it's a raised stage that the puppeteers they have professional puppeteers doing it with different actors voices to for the actual acting out of the voices really it's, it's a, if you if you don't care to touch the story it's well watching just watching the first episode just to know that that is what you're watching it's a, and, and the story is so good too. Of course, I like the magic and fiction. It's also a story, you know, from like childhood that I really like. So um, anyway, that's a little tangent, but Dark Crystal, great, great series. I actually, uh, I have the old board game from it that Brooke gave me for my birthday back there. So right here. So I'm, I have to... <laughs> I have to admit, so I am looking at screenshots of this on my computer as we're talking because yeah. I, is this, is this, this is essentially like an, an adult puppet show. I mean, right. Is that Abs what I'm. Abs absolutely. So the film was really? 1982. So if you look up like Netflix series, then it's obviously better quality now, but even then the puppets were great, but oh man. And you have like top, you have Mark Hamill voicing it. Um, really wow. you have, uh, what's his name from, um. Hot Fuzz, I forget his name, but I mean, it's a, it's an incredible production. But anyway, they canceled that for the first season, but oh, it's just so fantastic. Oh, well, okay. So I, okay. So, so the thought that I had in my mind was, so this is like, this is like Muppets, but hardcore. Hard, um, yeah, exactly. It, yeah. Well, it's, I mean, the 1982, I'm looking at a 1982 game screenshot that says by Henson Associates. So yep, I guess it. that's it. The original thing was kind of by the same, yeah, like Jim Henson. Wow. Yeah. And wow. if, you got to watch weird. it. I'll Even if you don't weird, like it, yeah. that's, you would really appreciate the the production of it. It's it's incredible. Wow, dude. That's yeah, crazy. Cool. cool. I'll have to that check was that out. Tangent. Yeah, definitely. That was. That's fascinating. Um, okay, cool. But yeah. Anyway, so yeah, I think kind of bottom line, I don't really have anything too much else sad about movies. Just the fact that oh, we, all, we all like them. Maybe not all, but 95% 90, of us like movies. And for, yeah. for good reason, but they're great. Well, it is, it is the, um, maybe not in the, um, maybe not when you're in your living room, although I would say most of the time when you're in your living room, but, um, but definitely when you're in the movie theater, it's kind of like they almost force you with cell phones and stuff to like stay focused on it. Movies yeah. are a two to three hour long form experience that a lot of the time you will not get distracted or pulled away by whatever thing. Yeah. If you're in movie mode, you know what I'm sure. saying? And so. Yeah. And That's I very much, if I'm sitting down to watch a movie, I'm watching a movie. I'm not paying attention to anything else. Yeah, for sure. The only exception is when you and I get together to watch a movie and we get three minutes in and we start talking about angels, demons, and philosophy. <laughs> Rock, um, Rocket, Rocket Man lasts, it's like a 90 minute movie. I think you went to my place for like 10 hours. It seemed, I was really more like four, but at the hours, times but... we paused, I think we had an hour break in between one and we were talking about angels, demons, drugs. Yeah. All yeah. All kinds, all kinds stuff. of crazy stuff that had nothing to do with Rocket Man. Oh man, that's awesome! But anyway, but we do so, pause so, the movie. <laughs> so what's next? Yeah, what's, what's so next? I, I'm really excited about this one, uh, video games. Um, yes, of course. I'm I'm making a video game slowly but surely. Um, and just chipping away at that, but well, more man, slowly than surely, right? Or more, more slowly than surely, but <laughs> then I slow and steady. That's what I hear. <laughs> well, there you go. Yeah, yeah, I know it. Something but, about uh, tortoise. And, and that is more of a hobby for me where I want to make a video game and I know I'll make it at some point and we'll see what happens. But anyway, the, um, 
I love, I just love video games. Uh, to me, even more than movies, I tell people, I think that they truly are the culmination of like the perfect art form. You, you have the music, um, which even you say, you know, you sometimes like, um, you know, for movies, I listen to video game, um, soundtracks, which they have, you know, professional, you know, um, oh yeah, me too. I mean, just they're top notch, especially with the AAA studios and, uh, they just, they really put in the budget for the music. So you had the music and then everything is created from scratch, not to put down how much effort goes into making a movie, but for a movie, oh, hey, they hire Steve and Alex as actors. We'll buy these clothes from Walmart. Here's the scene. Not for a video game. You have to create everything from scratch. You have to create forms. You have to program it all. It is, it is the creation of, you know, sometimes it's a dozen people, sometimes it's, you know, two or 300 people. And at the end of it all, you get to be a part of it as the gamer. So I am very big on, I really, I play a variety of games, but mostly now just with my time constraints, I play games really heavily focused on story, um, that has, you know, that sometimes, but depending on how long the video game will be, there might be, you know, 10 to 15 hours of cutscenes, and it's just a, it's an investment of, you know, emotion and time. And so get my headphones on, sit, sit right in front of the TV, probably too close to when I should. And just let the music take me over and the art and the story and the, the voice, you know, the actor's voices and, and not only just experience it, but then, okay, I get to be this person in the game. And it's just, uh, I just think it's, a, it's an excellent way. I, a lot of times when I play video games, it, it really inspires me to, you know, picture scenes again for writing. And it really kind of invokes that rigorousness in me where it's like, wow, like what a great story. Cause most of the games I play too are kind of fantasy related. And I, I think, you know, oh, I could apply this to my book or I can just envision stuff better. Um, but anyway, yeah, no, no surprise. I'm just a huge fan of, uh, video games as a medium for storytelling, um, as a whole. Yeah. I do have to admit, I never thought about video games as, uh, what you called it, the perfect art form, but I actually really like that. I, I, I thought about it for a moment. I think it's obviously it's opinion, but. True. Yeah, I mean, it's opinion, it's, but it is, you know. It's a way where it takes movies from viewing an art form to participating in it. Yeah, yeah, it, it, uh, it, there you go. It bridges that gap between reality and exactly. fiction, right? Yeah. Like we were talking about before in a very tangible way. Yeah. Um, for, for us. Um, I, it, it, it's weird. You know, I wish I had more to say about video games. I'm, I'm trying to get back into them right now. Our Nintendo Switch, which is the only game <laughs> platform that we have. Is lost. I have no idea where it is. And our kids, <laughs> our kids have done it. something. That's so I'm just like, I'm a word. You kid. Oh tornadoes, man. You, anyway, so. Have you so checked I, your son's backpack? So a little yeah, quick story. Yeah. I was over at uh, Steve's house a couple months ago and could not find my phone. And I thought I had it here. After like 20 minutes of kind of casually searching for it, all of a sudden, uh, Steve's youngest son comes out and he says, here it is. I found it. And I said, you just found it? And he said, yeah, I said, where did you find it? And he walked me over to his little backpack. He said, it was in here. <laughs> right, right, right. It's a magic yeah, he showed up in there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the magic jumped out of one of Alice's books and transported <laughs> yeah. it into there. Yeah. Uh, actually, now that you mentioned that, I don't, I, I don't think I have checked their backpack. So I probably need to look there. It's probably where it is. Um, but I had, I had recently gotten into, uh, uh, Starlink, uh, Atlas, which is a Star Fox game. And I, I, I either I either did mention it a few episodes ago or meant to. I can't remember which. <laughs> but um but I, I did get back into that a little bit and I, I've been trying to get back into video games a bit because it is a um it is something that I very, very much enjoyed when I was growing up. I, I had I have a lot of good memories playing video games with a couple of my best friends. Um and definitely a lot of memories even with my dad playing video games when I was growing up before he passed away. And so lots of good memories that that uh, I have for video games. I, I do. Um, I don't want to say it's a regret, um, but I just, I, I just, I got so focused on music after I moved to North Carolina, and then my, and then I, that was a hardcore focus from about 2005 into about 2016, early 2017, and then when I when I stopped that, I got I dove just headfirst into almost simultaneously. Um, business and Christian apologetics and theology. And that's, I mean, here we are, all, you know, blink of an eye in 2022. Yeah. And my 2005 to 2022 has been Man. pretty much focused on those three things, music, you know, my, my faith 
and then um, my the, my business endeavors. And so, you know, I mean, gosh, how, how quickly time goes. But in that time, I really never got back into video games like I wanted to. Now, I, I, I tried, you know, I had an Xbox with the Kinect thing. And um, I've got the, uh, like I said, I've got the Switch now that I can't find. Um, so I keep, I keep trying to get back into it and, because I really do have a deep appreciation I know for it. It. I and, um, that to me quite a few times. So yeah, yeah, I, I do, and, and and I'm even interested too. And and I this is where, um, and, and yeah, this is I think a good way to talk about this. So there are two things, real quick. Um, you mentioned my kids, and I'm glad you did because um, so I have four kids, and uh, so I've got a six, a five, a three, and a two. Just that and, and subtract one, <laughs> right? Yes, <laughs> and 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 and. Um, our oldest is, has always been, I, I think, ahead of the curve on, on learning. And we, we tend to attribute that now, whether or not it's true. Um, we, we, let's just say we let our kids, especially him though, have more screen time growing up than what maybe some would, would recommend. Um, and I, uh, and, and a lot, of course we, we monitor it. We pay close yeah. attention to it. We don't just let them do whatever. Yeah. Um, but especially our oldest, um, he had more opportunity to play on like, a you know, on, on the Kindle and stuff. We, we have the little kids Kindles. Um, and, um, it's, he, he has learned a lot through playing video games. And now I'm starting to see some of that in my five-year-old as well. Um, he's like super good at a couple of the video games that he plays. And I'm like, and, and so I, I don't, so I don't, I don't know. I, I, I'm a tech, I'm a techie, right? I'm a nerd. So I, I don't, I don't tend to think that screens are the boogeyman it, as big of a boogeyman as some people make them out to be. Now, obviously without, you know, of course we can talk about like, like pornography and all kinds of problems that, 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 and, and, yep. and, and, and particular issues that screens do have, mm -hmm. but there are also tremendous opportunities, learning the motor skills, learning the language skills that video games teach you, the, just the appreciation for the medium such that you could even get into things like coding and things from a young age. Like I thought it would be cool to they have like subscription boxes for kids to start teaching them at an early age, how to do like computer coding and stuff. And like, that's just one of those things. It's almost like learning what well, it is like learning another language. And even if you don't end up well, I can promise you, even if he didn't end up becoming a computer programmer or something one day, um, to grow up and have the knowledge embedded about how basic code works and even Just to even, understand it, yeah, and even even understanding it in, at a more intermediate level, if they didn't pursue it even further, I promise it would almost be more helpful than most of what they're going to learn going through school. Like, sorry, not sorry. Um, but like just having that as a real transferable skill going into the future, um, Absolutely. you're, you're yeah. always going to need somebody to code. You just know. knowing the concepts, even though like I've, I would say like I'm at the upper level of beginner still with coding. I'm definitely familiar now a lot, but there's still a long way to go. But even now, like when I, especially, especially how it relates to video games, cause that's what I'm really learning to code. When I play a video game now, I, I don't know specifically how they might code stuff, but I know generally, oh, they had to have been able to do it this way. Cause they coded it like this. I know the concepts and just that exactly. in itself is valuable to know that you could learn that stuff and understand how things, you know, work. Yeah. Yeah, exa exactly right. So I, I think that, you know, again, with, with it's, a, it's a tough line to balance, especially when you're talking about kids and stuff. But yeah, I mean, getting into those video games and um, they, I mean, it's been, it's been tangibly helpful for my, yeah. for my kids in ways that I can, no, it's been detrimental in a couple of ways too. And we've, you know, sometimes every now and then every few months or so, um, you know, we put them through a little bit of a detox where, okay, you, you know what I mean? Like you become a little bit too attached to this thing. Um, yeah. but thus far we've sort of seen the benefits outweigh, uh, those things. So, Good. so I, I mean, I think video gaming is, oh, the other thing I wanted to mention about it is, um, esports, right? So esports are yeah, video games basically, but a lot of people don't realize there's a huge industry around esports right now like there there are esports influencers that like like the like kids are looking up to in the same way that some people look up to like football players and things Absolutely. like that and people say oh you gotta be kidding me like you know all curmudgeonly about it you know what here's the thing 
if you can get, if you're allowed to get excited about a dude who makes millions of dollars for throwing a piece of pigskin through the air, yeah. then I'm, then you can at least then you have no right to judge anybody who gets excited about playing a video game that actually takes a lot of a lot of, skill. a lot of motor skills, yep. hand eye coordination, lots of practice, and in many cases, lots of deep thinking and strategic thought. To get through. I mean, too. Most of them skill. are team games too. You That's know? exactly right. That's exactly right. And so if you can get I, excited about that, like, man, I, I think you get excited least, about this too. Especially if you do find a game, you know, just to play with friends, man, that builds like camaraderie and helps you work with people. And obviously you have, for sure. unfortunately, uh, you know, gamers are known for getting like reckless and, you know, raging and throwing their controllers and stuff, but that's sure. a, that's a hard issue. Not a, uh, <laughs> not a video. It's a side game. effect. It's a side, it's a side it's effect. effect. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, you can take medicine where the side effect is death. I'm pretty sure yeah. video game. You know, yeah, side effects absolutely. are okay. But uh, yeah, I think that's really that off. Um, yeah, for sure. Yeah, that's a good one. Um, and then the last one, I think we'll probably just talk about it a little um, just briefly because it kind of transitions to what we're going to be talking about uh, next week. Uh, so our final one is news and media. Um, what's kind of funny about saying that now is I think that a lot of people, especially especially our generation and definitely the generation below us, don't don't care about like the traditional news media, um, you know, right. the stuff, whether it's CNN, MSNBC, Fox news, I mean, just whatever list to them. And it, it kind of goes to all the stuff that we talked about before, cause you have podcasts, you have just social media saying, Hey, here's a video of exactly what happened there. Like, why would you need a news station to tell you what happened when you can see yeah. a person 10 feet away from what happened filming it. And so yeah. just how it kind of relates the story again, yeah, we're going to talk about this a little bit more next week, but, um, the news, especially kind of depending on the audience, you can have stories be told. You can have the same story told in two totally different lights. Yeah. Um, and not even just talk. I mean, usually it's divided into, you know, Republican and Democrat, but even beyond that, it could be, you know, whether it's a teen magazine or a oh, yeah. you know newspaper for adults. I mean, there's just so many different aspects of how to sell a story and you know keep the viewers coming and watching no, yeah that's pretty much all i have to say about that for for the time being. yeah yeah i'm 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 interested uh, so i i'll save that aspect of it of course uh for our next episode i'm very interested to talk about that but i'm also interested in um the in the stylistic um it well in in the style of it okay so for example um Two things are true at the same time. One thing that is true is it seems to me the news is stylistically fake. What I mean by that is, is even the way that news anchors talk, yes. it just yes. feels, it just feels fake to me. I'm like, it's you don't talk like this in real life. It gives me the don't. same vibe as someone who talks to you and then when they pray, their demeanor changes. Oh my and gosh, they, that drives me crazy. Uh, I won't say who it is, but someone who I'm very close to in my life does that, and it just bothers me so bad. Like oh to yourself, gosh. but yeah, no. I so it ran the same vein as that. Absolutely. Oh my gosh, yes, and, and, and <laughs> so yeah, and 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 so 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 right. So stylistically, and especially being like Gen Z and and millennials and stuff, I'm like, I I don't think this is going to be around very long now 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 all that to say uh, there's another angle to this and 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 so the flip side of the coin is is these companies have been around for a freaking long time and they know what they're doing um a lot of what they do is on purpose and it's it's kind of like there are some things that work even though we don't understand really well um why they work mm -hmm. for example for example People still buy things, and this is why I have an entire business built around this sort of idea, but people still buy things off of, like, long-form sales letters with hypey language and, like, big words. And, 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 and I'm almost like, now, I do this, and I, and I, but and I don't know, it's, it's a particular <laughs> style. It's a particular yeah. form that for some reason works. And so I guess what I'm saying is when I'm, when I'm, okay, so I'm 32 right now. In 18 years, when I'm 50, Am I going to wake up and like suddenly that appeals to me? And that and now, now I'm like, I've, I've hit this random old age where like, oh, yeah, segment or, gets caught. And um, it's they, a huge thing or a generational thing. Right, right, right. It's got to so be generational I'm, unless you really lose your marbles between now and then. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know. And I just, I do know that um, 
um, the the more that see we never lived in a time like we live now okay so that is a factor here that there never in the history of time has there been something like for example whether or not you agree with his policies a president who could just go on twitter and talk directly to the people and say what he's saying absent any media spin and funny how basically twitter you could basically call them the media in this case which is another topic altogether but basically they banned him and and so so it's interesting how you have like sort of this anyway the censorship thing that's going on but even beyond that it's just like we never lived in a time where we talked about it the other day with the war in ukraine stuff um it's like you can be basically on the battlefield now like seeing things happen in real time it's never been that way in the past and so like now the news is almost making itself irrelevant because especially for like certain segments who are seeing this more than others, yeah. it's so blatantly biased one way or the other, you know, liberal or conservative or just whatever. When you're talking news, unfortunately, that's like politics is sort of like where the line is yeah. now. Um, but it's, 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 there's some really interesting stuff going on with that, that, I'm actually optimistic. I, I unashamedly put myself in the camp of being optimistic that those that those big news networks will one day be gone because I think that their true colors have been exposed. And I think there are other companies doing doing great stuff that are even I mean, I think of the Daily Wire and I you know, I'm a conservative. I'm sorry, crucify me for that if you want to, but I, I think they're doing something really cool and across the vertical of what they're doing, they're actually creating products that are worth your dollar and you're supporting them not through the ad spots that they can sell or through the frankly and i'm sorry to say this but through the lies that they can tell and and rather they're being supported directly by people who they deserve um you know deserve good products and things like who they feel yeah. deserve good products and things like that they're so. being very smart with their business and what they're doing they um yeah just yeah yeah no yeah and, and not just them there's 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 all kinds of examples too and, and i you know, maybe there's examples from the other side of the aisle that people can mention as, as well that I, I'm just not as aware of. But, but, but everybody surely is is seeing through, even like Fox and CNN, and like, like we have to understand that it is purely a numbers and ratings. Oh yeah, and absolutely. Games you're going to do point. get your numbers. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So 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 that. anyway, that was uh that was good. Yeah, I think so. I, yeah, that was fun. Um took a good trip around a lot of different topics um didn't really get down to too much serious stuff but at the same time it's good to kind of recap and get these base layers in and just have fun yeah. talking about things and your yeah, brain sure. kind of wanders around quite a bit too <laughs> yeah yeah um, I love it. no it's it's good i didn't pick a story of the week did you okay pick one? yeah i i i didn't like i'm looking at mine right now i was prepared so uh, uh, i didn't do i did not pick one but i'm looking at one and i i have one that you know we can it can be both of ours for all for all i care Go for um it. well we'll just we'll say two quick things um one quick thing and this may be uh well you know what we might save it for next time we'll save that one for next time for for this time um i'm just gonna go back to elon musk again elon musk is just literally shaking <laughs> yeah, up the world right share, now let's share that I, one I just freaking love it. Okay, I'm sorry. I can't. I can't help it because I'm a business guy, and I'm just like, ah, oh, capitalism. Like it's so awesome. Um, but it's it's like in in all seriousness. Um, so Twitter, Elon Musk buys not. It's basically ten percent. I mean nine point two uh, percent or whatever it is uh, of Twitter. Just randomly, I think over the weekend or last week or whatever. Let, buys, let, that, uh, let that sink in. He bought 10% of 10% of Twitter, a freaking Twitter. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's true. We should slow down. on that. That's crazy. It is. It is crazy that he had that, that he, had the power. but look overnight, the dude is on the board of directors <laughs> and he's, I, he's right. Again, posting on Twitter about the shakeups that are about to happen. I saw this thing was like, you want this button added? Do you want this person reinstated? And I was like, this yeah. to be fake. I was like, this uh, is must thing. And I was like, no, this is. This is no, no. And Strong. you know, it just kind of, it just kind of further cements and grows out of what we were talking about. That it's like, there are people, now Elon Musk, and just like, let's just be real. Elon Musk, he's not a Christian. He's, I don't even think he's a conservative. He's probably more along the lines of like a classical liberal. Yeah. And he's like, yeah, like we're not, we're not going to do like, okay, Twitter, this is. The, the point that he made, for any who haven't seen the story, the point that he made is that Twitter has sort of become the de facto town square. And yes. when you're in the town square, if you cannot share freely your views in the town square, 
then like that's a problem for democracy and for freedom. And um, he's like, we need to fix this. And so what does he do? He buys 9.2% of the company and says, we're going to freaking fix this. And he starts pulling people. Do you want an edit button? Do you want this? Do you want that? And he's like, it's, it's, it's happening. And then, I, I, and I'll let you speak to that. But then today I saw another thing where basically there's a, one of the Russian, um, so, so, we talked a couple of weeks ago about how how Elon actually helped out Ukraine with his Starlink um, internet system because they they needed internet in there. And, and there was a Russian who posted on Twitter, a Russian military commander who I think it was today or yesterday posted on Twitter about how if Russia is, keeps getting blocked and is not able to support the ISS, the International Space Station, how it's basically going to come crashing down. And Elon Musk replies to his tweet with a, with a tweet of his own that is nothing but a picture of the SpaceX logo. And another <laughs> and another dude who apparently has um, inner workings with NASA and specifically the, the International Space Station posts like a 20-thread long message with graphics and everything about how Elon could send dragons, which is one of their names yeah. for their one of their rockets, could send dragons up and situate in such a way as to be able to actually support, <laughs> support the International Space Station. And it would basically just gave this huge F you to Russia. And I'm like, oh my gosh, this is the coolest thing. Like, and you're just watching it happen on the world stage. And it's, it's, I don't know, in some sense, it's, it's just, it's just beautiful. It, it, you know what it does for me? And I, this is probably like, a, you know, people are going to be like, where did you pull this out of? But I'm reminded of the line from Jurassic Park that Dr. Ian Malcolm says, where he says life finds a way and i don't know i'm just i'm just this is where to be truly consistent with the the values of freedom that humans value humans are only and i'm just going to be like super blunt this may be as blunt as i'll ever be on this podcast so i'm sorry but um but um human uh the woke bs that is in the world today is not sustainable long term it's not sustainable long term and even your elon musk and your joe people who have no interest in necessarily conservative values or or christian or or like religious things or whatever they are totally not that way at all even they see this and and people are more people are ironically waking up to the deception of it yeah. and um like life is impossible on those worldviews and so it's fixing yeah, itself you said you it has to. your bumps on the way but sustainable long term it just it just it just can't happen. That's right. That's <laughs> um, right. I've heard, uh, again, I, I hate getting in politics too much, but um, I've heard like before something about in order for, um, even though liberalism has a different term now than when it does, that in order for liberalism to um, to exist, conservatism have to, has to support it. <laughs> um, yeah. 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 Um, yeah. Yeah. But anyway, um, two things about Elon. Uh, that's just... Uh, as they say, we must be living in a simulation where an inventor in person like Elon owns a company called Tesla. <laughs> it's just, uh, right. I like know, I know. it could have, it could have, it could have been named, you know, sunspot or it could, it could have been named a million other names, but nope, it's called Tesla. And right. And, but, yeah. and then one of my favorite things, and sometimes I'll just randomly think of it. It makes me laugh is. There's a clip of Elon and I think they just made their own flamethrowers for the, for the heck of it. And you see him, I think he's got like, not necessarily a muscle shirt, but a real tight shirt on and he's walking out with this flamethrower and they're just like, turn it on or whatever. And he just blasts the sucker and he's just like the happiest guy in the world. He just, he just loves stuff. He just loves making stuff and having fun, making toys and everything. Yeah. Yeah. He's, he, that's, he is, uh. It's so funny. He's an inspiration in that way, particularly because he does not go out of his way to try to be of an inspiration or think of himself as one. It's like, as of right now, he's, he's officially the richest man on, I think on the planet. I think he's the richest man so, on the, yeah. on, on the planet. The irony of which is that he's trying to colonize another one. Um, but he <laughs> is the, he is the richest man on the planet. And yet, like, if you hear him talk about that, number one, he's very down to earth. And yeah. number two, he's like, He's like, it's not like this is all like cash, liquid assets. It's like stock positions and stuff like that. He's like, he's like, I just wake up every day and have fun. Like, I, I want to. I mean, he. I remember him talking on Joe Rogan's podcast about he, how he literally told them to make the rocket more pointy, 
even though it would cost more money and be less aerodynamic in that particular situation because he heard somebody in a line say, make it more pointy. And he said yeah. in a movie, and he's like, I want to do that too. So he told his rocket guys to make the freaking thing more pointy. And I'm just like, you know. It's, it's hard awesome. not to like Elon. I know. It is. It's very difficult not to. So uh, All right, interesting stuff, man. Good stuff. Yep. Yep. All right. Well, thanks everyone for listening. This has been a great topic. I've had a lot of fun. I'm yes. glad we were able to do one that was a little bit more fun, a little bit more lighthearted. The next one coming up is more serious um, and um, maybe a little even somber. I could even say that. But I think uh, I think this will leave you with some good uh, discussion for this week. And uh, yeah, can't wait to see you in the next one. Be sure to share it with your friends if you if you enjoyed your time. Alex, been a pleasure as always. Absolutely. We'll see you next time. All right.